It is great to be with you this morning, and uh, before I preach you all to sleep, um, I, I figured I'd take this opportunity to kind of just have a, a proud dad moment. Uh, for, for those of you uh, that don't know, Elizabeth and I just welcomed our third child into the world a month and two days ago, um, and so you can go ahead and throw up some of those pictures. Essie Lynn is our new baby's name, and she is an absolute joy. Do we got, did the computer crash? Oh, everybody say, oh. <laughs> Essie Lynn, she is a joy. She's keeping me tired because she's keeping me up at night. Um, and that's my beautiful wife, Elizabeth, who is the best mom and wife in the world. Our middle child is Paisley Jean. She's 18 months old, and she's a pistol. I could use some prayers for that girl. <laughs> She is learning new words every week, and she's just growing, and she's, she's really adjusted well to having uh, Essie in the picture. And our oldest is Sam Lewis, and, and he's, he's three and a half years old, and he is the ideal big brother. He is the best big brother a parent could ask for. Um, he is so kind and patient <laughs> most of the time to, uh, to his uh, siblings. And he's a big help to his mom. But Sam, he, he really loves sports. And, and one sport that he really loves is golf. And now I know that might sound strange that a three and a half year old would want to sit down and watch golf or play golf, but he's actually getting pretty good. So I, I decided to, to, to show him off in this video here. <laughs> All right, now, now for. For the golfers in the room, I want to watch it one more time. Just, just listen. Okay, so that's, that's pretty good, but we've still got some work to do. We're working on hitting the ball first before the ground. I could hear a little bit of a fat shot in that. Um, and and his, his arm isn't really straight on the way back, and so we're working. I'm just teasing. He's three years old. He's, he's, he's doing great. So that's enough proud dad moments. This morning, turn in your Bibles to 2 Corinthians chapter 5. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, and my prayer for you this morning and, and for us as a church, as believers in Jesus Christ, is that we would move past our feelings and standing on what we, we feel, and we would stand on what is fact, factual and, and truthful and, and, and right. Pilots, when flying a plane, need to go off of what their instruments are reading and not what they are feeling. Fog or, or heavy darkness can cause even the best of pilots to become disoriented. And, and pilots are all familiar with this term, black hole vertigo. And that happens when spatial disorientation sets place, where left feels like right and up feels like down and right becomes wrong. And you could be absolutely, positively swear on a stack of Bibles sure that you need to go down when in reality you're already headed towards the earth at a terminal velocity in a graveyard spiral. That's exactly what happened in July of 1999 to John F. Kennedy Jr. when he was flying his personal plane over the Atlantic Ocean off the coast of Massachusetts. He crashed his plane in, in, in the frigid waters, and when Navy divers uncovered his body, they found him still harnessed in his seat with all the sophisticated instruments in, in the plane to prevent such a thing from happening. He never issued an emergency call. Instead, he trusted his feelings instead of trusting what his instruments were reading. And trusting his feelings cost him and his wife and his sister-in-law their lives that evening. Too often in our walk with God, we allow our feelings to override the truth in our lives. And this morning, we're continuing in this series, I Am Who You Say I Am, and, and, and I'm wanting us to move from feelings to fact. And one of the facts and one of the truths that God has spoken over those who have called on the name of Jesus is that you are saved. When you attach yourself to Jesus by faith, God speaks this very simple truth that you are saved. But Satan wants to disrupt this truth and cause us to have insecurities in this false understanding of salvation. Before we go any further, I just want to pray. Holy Father, we just thank you for the opportunity to look into your word. 
I pray that lies would begin to, to fall away. We would see your truth. We would see your word. God, would your Holy Spirit quicken and anoint this, anoint this message to our hearts, make it come alive and real to us, and may we realize this morning just how amazing your grace really is. Amen. Amen. So this morning, I want to share with you uh, an amazing story, but I also want you to know that this is a very unusual and rare story. It's an amazing story, but it is so rare. And it's a story about God who, because he chose to, made a way for you and I to be connected to him. The reason why that's so rare and, and, and so unusual is because in most religions, it's all about the individual trying to work their way to their God. But God, because he wants to be in a personal relationship with you, created a way through his son Jesus so that you can live in unity with Christ. But many of us have spent a lot of our lives trying to figure out how to work our way towards God, how to earn his love, how to receive his forgiveness. And I don't want to us to live this life where there's this looming question lingering over us of, I hope I've done enough. I sure pray I've done enough. I've I've done more than this person. Well, God, when it comes time to judge me, remember that I'm, I'm not as bad as that person. It is very difficult to live a confident life when your decisions, your choices, and your actions are the things that will reconnect you to God. You'd have to make sure that your good deeds outweigh your bad deeds. So let's take a look at this unusual, amazing story of grace and how God has made a way to be connected to him. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, starting in verse 18. All of this is from God. All of this is from God. Reconciliation. This whole passage, these next verses, is about what God is doing. All of this is from God who reconciled us to himself through Christ and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. So God reconciles us through Christ, but what is reconciliation? Let's keep on reading. Verse 19, that God was reconciling the world to himself in Christ. Here it is, not counting men's sins against them. And he has committed to us this message of reconciliation. Reconciliation is this. It's God who is fixing a broken relationship between humanity and himself. Sin, we are sinful beings, and God is a a holy God. And when we sin, we create a barrier between us and God. And reconciliation is when God decided to come in and remove that barrier, to remove that sin, so that we could be in a relationship with him. He's choosing to, to, to... Uh, not remember and not count your sins against you. This is amazing, okay? This is absolutely amazing that there is a God who created everything and wants to be in a relationship with you. He knows everything about you. He knows your deepest, darkest secrets. He knows every thought that you've ever had, and he still wants to be in a relationship with you. That's amazing because there's people on earth that don't want to have a relationship with you, and they don't know your deepest, darkest thoughts. But Satan wants to to disrupt this amazing story of grace. Satan Satan wants to add to this story, and and he begins to lie to us. And one of the lies is that, that I've done too much wrong for God to save me. I've done too much wrong for God to want to save me, and maybe that's you this morning. Maybe you feel like, man, I've come in here, I've, I've messed up too much, I've sinned too much, my past is too dirty, I, I, am, I, am, I am just damaged goods, how could God ever use me? And, and he's sick of forgiving me, and, and he doesn't want to reconcile with me. How could God ever love me? My sin is too great, my past is too great, but the truth is that God's grace is ineffable. Turn to your neighbor and say, ineffable. Turn to your another neighbor and say, ineffable. Okay, I'm hearing lots, ineffable? Like, is that a word? Did you just make that up? No, I didn't make it up. Thank you very much. My mom is an editor. You can give her uh, credit for this. Ineffable is this. The definition of ineffable is too great or extreme to be expressed or described in words. Too great or extreme to be expressed or described in words. 
Synonyms of ineffable are inexpressible, indescribable, beyond words, undefinable. God's grace is all of those things. And it's almost insulting to God to think that you've messed up so much and your sin is so great that God's grace that's ineffable, that can't even be described, that's beyond words, cannot cover your sin. It's like admitting in your heart that what Jesus did on the cross wasn't good enough for you. Last summer, Elizabeth and I hosted a bunch of cookouts at our house. Um, And in a total of four weeks, we had over 300 people in and out of our house at these cookouts. And it was awesome. It was fun. I think I went through three propane tanks on on the grill. Um, We played games. There's a lot of connecting. And it was exhausting. And that's why we're not doing it again this year (laughs) with the newborn. But at the 40s cookout, there, there was a bunch of kids in the basement, and uh, one of the kids was Briar Shaw, and, and they attend the early service. Kevin and Ashley Shaw, uh, they, they were newer to church, and, and Briar, five years old, he finds this baseball in my basement, and he thinks, you know what, I'm going to throw it at this girl. I don't know if he was flirting with her or if he was upset with her, but he decides it's a good idea to throw this baseball, real baseball, in my basement at this girl. The problem is, is that he completely missed the girl, and he drills my wall, right? He leaves this little dent there five inches below my TV, okay? So no, no, no big deal, but, but Briar— um, you know, he, he goes to his parents, and his parents find out, and Kevin is upset, and he's embarrassed, and he's, he's, he's apologetic, and Ashley and, and Briar, they come up to me, and they've already got tears in their eyes. You can just see that this whole family doesn't know me. They don't know how I'm going to respond, and they're fearful in, in, in coming and asking me for forgiveness, and, and Briar's here, and he's, he's crying, and he, he tells me he's sorry, and, 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 and in that moment, I was able to get down on my knee and say, Briar, I can see that, that, that you're sorry, and I forgive you, buddy. Most, most people love things and use people, but I, I love people and I use things. What's a house for but, but to live in? Mistakes happen. If I, if I cared more about my house than I care about you, Briar, I wouldn't have had these cookouts. I wouldn't have left, which I'm still thinking about, why did I leave a baseball in, in my basement, right? I wouldn't have left a baseball in my basement. I care more about you, Briar, than I care about my house. And I love you, and I forgive you. And he promised he wouldn't ever do it again. You know, but here's the thing. I think that many of us can relate to Briar. We, we've sinned. We ha- we, we've made this mistake. We never thought through the consequence of our actions. And, and now, because we don't know the heart of the Father and how God is going to respond, we're kind of sitting on the outside with tears in our eyes, afraid to approach God and ask for forgiveness because we're afraid of how he's going to respond. But can I tell you that God's grace is ineffable? He loves you so much. He's not concerned with what you did in your past. He's concerned with where you're headed in your future. He has a purpose. He has a plan for you. He wants to forgive you. He wants to pour out his blessings and his love and his favor on you. God's grace is ineffable, but but Satan doesn't just stop there with that lie. He doesn't just lie to to those with a track record. He, He lies to other people and says, you need to earn your salvation. Satan leads people to believe that God will love them more or be quicker to forgive them if if they do this or if they do that. And believing this lie could lead to something I called eternal insecurity, where, where you're constantly feeling like you're walking into the family of God and walking out of the family of God. And this week I'm saved because I'm walking with the Lord, and next week I'm not saved because I'm not walking with the Lord. And, and, and we base our salvation off of what we do or what we don't do. Listen, the truth is that salvation is a gift that cannot be earned. There is nothing that you can do to earn that gift. There's nothing that you can do that will reconcile the relationship between you and God. There's nothing we can do. There's nothing we can say. There's nothing to give, think, or anything that will put us back into a relationship with God because God is holy and just and we are sinful and fallen and the gap is too great. There is nothing that we can do to close the gap between our sinfulness and God's holiness. 
the gap is too far. Now, I believe that in every boy is the desire to jump. My son, three and a half years old, loves jumping. I'm just like, channel that energy to me, you know? He jumps on the couch. He jumps off the couch. He jumps on his bed. He always wants to go to our neighbor's house and jump on the trampoline. He jumps over his baby sister after I've told him multiple times to not jump over his baby sister. He loves to jump. In us is this desire to jump. And guess what? Now you can win a medal at the Olympics for jumping. <laughs> How many are familiar with Carl, the name Carl Lewis? Right? Carl Lewis. All right, uh, if you haven't, uh, I saw like none of the millennials raise your hand. That's because he was a track star in the 80s and 90s, and he was one of the most dominant in the field. Between 1984 and 1996, he won four consecutive gold medals in the men's long jump. And as I was reading about his history and his legacy as a, a track athlete, um, I, I came across the 1991 World Championships in Tokyo. And that was where he set his personal best record. And I got to thinking, how far could he really be jumping? Like, okay, you're earning a medal for jumping. That's something that, you know, I can do, right? And, and so I, I decided I'm going to get out my tape measure and just figure out exactly how far is this guy flying through the air. So I'm going to start this over here. See, I have, I have an easier time in the second service than I did the first. And, Keep on going. This absolutely blows my mind. All right. Oh, that's a six. 29 feet, one inch, and three sixteenths. Now, I don't know about you, but when I first pulled this out and I was reading about it, and I was like, there's a guy who jumped through the air that far, I, you know, through my mind, I'm just trying to fathom a guy jumping. Dun, 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 dun. <laughs> however, however they do it, you know, they, they kind of swim through the air. I can't fathom jumping half of this. I, I can't. You want me to try it? I've got my slick shoes on. <laughs> Challenge accepted. I'm going wait out here. All right, I'm outside right now. Oh, it's raining. <laughs> oh. Ow! <laughs> Ow! Note that shoes from Spain do not have cushion. <laughs> oh! Ow! Zach, could you shut that outside door? It's raining when I went out to get my speed. Hey, I got about halfway. That's pretty good. I didn't get halfway? Oh, my goodness. Do it again. Yeah, right. I'll tell you what, Dad. I'll do it if you do it. Man. I cannot fathom jumping that far. Now, I don't, I don't care if, if you trained for it, if, if you changed your diet, if you lifted weights, if you had the nicest track shoes and the nicest track um, uh, suit, if you were bred for it, every single one of us here would come up short if we were to try to jump that far. And yet we're talking about an athletic event. Now I want to pose this question to you. How much farther do you think the gap is between where we have fallen and the holy righteousness of God? And what are we possibly going to do about that? Turn in your Bible to so Romans chapter 3. This is one of the clearest passages of, of how we're in need of God's grace. This passage it, it just puts us all in the same boat where we're just thinking, uh-uh, no way. There is absolutely no way. Nothing I can do. We are all just in the same boat together. Romans 3, starting in verse 19. Now we know that whatever the law says, it says to those who are under the law, so that every mouth may be silenced and the whole world held accountable 
to God, okay? For those who didn't know, the law came in 10 simple commandments. How many are perfect in the 10 commandments? Thou shalt not lie, cheat, steal, commit adultery, put anything before God, right? Okay, so let's not even kid ourselves this morning that we can obtain holiness and we can get to God's holiness by observing the law. Verse 20, therefore no one will be declared righteous in his sight by observing the law. We just admitted that. Rather, through the law we will become conscious of our sin. So no one, no one will be declared righteous by observing it. We cannot do it, but because there's a law, because there's a standard, because there's this bar that has been set, we become conscious that we need something else because we cannot do it. It makes us aware that we are in great need. Now, if you just read verses 19 and 20, that'd be pretty depressing news. But luckily, verse 21, things start to shift. But now, Righteousness from God apart from the law has been made known. Now there's a way that we can be righteous before God and it's not by observing the law. That is great news. Verse 22, this righteousness from God comes through faith in Jesus Christ to all who believe, jump to 23, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. In other words, if we had to jump ourselves over to the glory of God, we would all come up short. But I think sometimes we misread this, this verse. We read and all have, have, have sinned and fall short of the glory of God, period. But there's a comma. There's good news that follows. All have sinned and fall short of the glory of God, comma, and are justified, which means made just as if we had never sinned. We are justified freely because it's a gift by God's grace through the redemption that came by Jesus Christ. That is the best news that you, that I, that anybody could ever receive. That the God who created everything loves us so much that he made a way for us to be in a relationship with him. Yet somehow, over the course of many well-intended sermons and church services, there are millions of Christians that have taken their eyes off of Jesus and place it on what to do or what not to do. There are people here this morning that came in tired because they are trying to earn God's love. Because you're trying to earn God's favor and forgiveness and grace. You might be here this morning and, and you're more caught up with what to do and what not to do than you are caught up with spending time with the Father. You're more concerned with checking off your, your list of attending church on Sunday than you are actually hearing from the Lord and hearing from the Word or having an encounter with Him during worship. Maybe this morning you feel that church is more of a chore and a duty than it is a joy. You see, when, when God saves us, He places His Spirit inside of us. I like to think of it as God's placing his DNA inside of me. Now, all of us have DNA, okay? Uh, your biological parents pass down DNA. I don't know how it works because I, 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 that's way above my pay grade, okay? But we have DNA inside of us. And if you know my dad and you know me, you would know that we're very similar in a lot of ways. The more time I, I spend with my dad, the more I find myself behaving like him, which now that I say that out loud is actually horrifying. <laughs> not really. I, I find myself sitting like him, uh, not using straws at restaurants like him, thinking like him, talking like him, acting like him, telling lame jokes like him. I, I find myself with similar political views. I find myself rooting for the same sports teams and, and, and have the same interests and hobbies. But those shared traits could go away if I were to spend less time with him. Without a doubt, if I were to spend less time with my father, I would begin to adapt a different worldview. I, I would begin to speak differently. I wouldn't sit and cross my legs like a girl. I, my jokes would improve tremendously. I would see things different. I would do things different. My sports teams will never change. I'll, I'll always be a Yankees fan. But without a doubt, 
without a doubt, I would begin to change. Despite having my father's DNA woven into me as a being, I would begin to change. Christianity is not this big list of rules and regulations. Religion has turned Christianity into something that it's not. Christianity is simply loving God with all of your heart. And when you love somebody with all of your heart, you're going to spend time with them. And as you spend time with them, guess what? You're going to love the things that they love. And as you spend time with them, you're going to do the things that they do. And as you spend time with them, you're going to become passionate about the things that he is passionate about. Obedience does not come from striving. It comes from abiding. As we walk with him, as we abide with him, as we stick close to him, your heart will begin to see his heart. Your eternal insecurities of being saved or not saved will go away because you have been around the Father and you become secure in his love for you, in his ineffable grace for you, in his ineffable mercy for you. As you walk with Christ, he will lead you and direct you and keep you from harm and sin. I tell my son when we're in a parking lot, wherever that might be, and and I say, Sam, stick right by my side. If I walk, you walk. If I stop, I stop. Why? Because I'm six foot four and cars see me. And, And not only that, because I have an awareness of what's going on in that parking lot. I, you know. I'm, I'm not going to lead my puddle-jumping three-year-old into harm and into d- danger. I'm going to keep him safe. And, and he not only feels safe and secure in my presence, he is safe and secure in my presence. Can I just say this morning, you will never, ever experience the, the secure, safe feeling of salvation until you learn to abide and stick close and walk with God, your Father. Would you stand with me? And as you stand, put away all distractions. And would you close your eyes? God, speak to us this morning. Speak to hearts, Lord. Maybe you're here and you've been trying to earn God's love and grace and forgiveness and and you just haven't even realized that you've shifted from being with Christ to doing for Christ, and you're tired, or or maybe you're feeling insecure in your relationship with God. You might have realized that your walk with God has slowly turned into a do more for Christ and sin less walk instead of a stick close to my side walk. You've slowly slipped away from a relationship-oriented faith, but you're wanting to abide with Christ. Before the works, before the self-help books, you are just tired and you want to abide and walk with Christ. If that's you, would you just simply raise your hand this morning just saying, I'm tired and I just need to be with the Father. I need to not get caught up with what not to do or what to do. Yes, there's hands all over. Yes, yes, yes. I'm gonna pray for you in just a moment. Continue with your eyes closed and just an attitude of worship. Is there anyone here this morning that has never asked Jesus to save them? You have never approached God because you're afraid of how he'll respond, or or maybe you've never even heard that there's a God that loves you and so desperately wants to be in a relationship with you. If that's you this morning, would you just repeat this prayer after me? God of everything, forgive me, help me, save me. I need your grace. I thank you for what you did, and in return, I give you my life, and I will abide with you. I will stick close to you for all of my days. God, I pray today for anyone who has felt the need or necessity that they need to earn your grace. I pray that people will be set free from the lie that we have to earn it, that we have to do something. God, and I just pray as we experience your heart and your grace that it would launch us forward into action, that we would be servants in response to the gift of grace that we have received. God, I pray that people here would be broken of of shame and guilt and we would be encouraged, we would be happy, we would be secure, we would be excited, we would be inspired to share this amazing grace, not of what we've done, but of what you have done and your great love for us, God. May people be set free from the guilt that they've carried as we turn our eyes completely to your son, Jesus. We love you. 
Amen. Amen.